interventions right now for the suicide rates in India. Grief can also stem from stress and anxiety associated with slow and creeping changes in one's environment. Feelings that many of us are experiencing as the winters become uncannily warmer and extreme weather events become more frequent. There's a whole variety of ways that people experience ego grief. Some are acute impacts, if we're thinking of things like the fires that are happening in California right now, that just seem to be so much more common than they ever have been before. It's almost like our world is slowly adapting to its own destruction. Um, people are seeing the shifts in, the in, in these environments over months, over years, decades, and feeling the ongoing sense of pain and suffering and of the watching of a beloved place change. And our new, our new ones are actually coming into this world. And this is just the norm. This is the new normal for them. Communities whose livelihoods and ways of living are inextricable from their natural environments, though, are on the front lines of this crisis. For example, in Inuit com um, communities located in um, the northern part of Canada right now, in Newfoundland and Labrador, temperatures have been warming twice as fast as the rest of the world. Their worlds are changing in front of them at a dramatic pace. Um, this has led to diminishing ice cover, shorter winters, unpredictable weather, and like other public health challenges, the burden of climate's mental health impacts falls primarily on, on these groups who, who are already vulnerable. Um, the losses of these communities that they've been suffering in every corner of their lives are unending. And really, especially folks who are saying that we are people of the ice, we are people of the river, we are people of the standing stone, we are people of the hemp. We, indigenous people, we identify with the land that we come from. And those lands are changing dramatically right now. What happens when we can no longer be those people? When we grieve the loss of a person, we come together with other people and perform rituals to work through these elements of grief. But when it's the loss of a place, or the degradation of a body of water, or when a, spe when a species collapses, there are simply no rituals for processing this loss. This brings us to our next collective grief, ancestral trauma. Let me take we all have a long line of family who carried seeds, the seeds of this in them. As we carry the seeds of our future generations, to surround ourselves with the images, belongings, and memories of our beloved ancestors how, is how we remind ourselves why and who we are, how we became, and how we're becoming. Being a visibly racialized indigenous woman with the complex intersection of ancestral lineages, I can only speak from my unique ancestral background. Folks who were Haudenosaunee, black on my mother's side, and English, German, and French on my father's. My experience is a unique blend and a tangled mess of indigenous peoples, enslaved peoples, and white folks who not only benefited from the system their ancestors created, but who literally created the system. As the climate crisis grows more intense, many of us are searching for our ancestors and trying to reconnect to our indigenous ways of being, doing, and knowing as an approach to sovereignty, empowerment, and healing the land. We are dusting off our lineages, proudly stepping into our identities as global indigenous peoples and celebrating who we are despite the Western culture that tells us that we are other, that we don't belong, that past tensifies and sepia tones us, that steals our lands, stole from our lands, or fetishizes us. As we reclaim these rights and step into our responsibilities, we need, to pay, we need to pay attention to these intersections of lineage and not fall prey to generalizing their experiences or similarly fetishizing them through the romanticization of their identities. To heal our ancestors is to see them in all their messiness, complexity, and complications. Getting to know our ancestors usually begins with the humanization of them and their complexities. Working with our ancestors removes the romanticized mystery of them and quickly teaches us, whether we like it or not, that there are pieces of them that we carry that maybe we don't like so much. 
Reconnecting with my Haudenosaunee ancestor ways has been profoundly triggering as I learned about the real experiences of residential school, genocide, murder, and the loss of homelands and land dispossession. Learning that my great-great-grandfather was a black farmer summoned the connections to a bloodline that was cut off through enslavement, land loss, and denial. Seeing the faces of my white ancestors looking back at me in the mirror has illuminated the double-edged sword of the white individualist legacy of harm in service of greed. Each of these threads of my lineage has woven me into who I am, and if not dealt with, will certainly carry on in my own life. Getting to know my ancestors, all my ancestors, has helped me identify the points of healing that need attention. It's with the knowledge of what, the, what harm was done or what trauma was experienced that gave me a concrete plan of action to help me heal through my own actions in this plane. For me, the trauma looked like language and culture loss, physical abuse, sexual abuse, chronic stress, alienation from homelands, and all the other aspects of ethno stress that leave our souls bereft of joy and our bodies carrying a legacy of pain, fear, and shame. But the healing doesn't stop there. I also have ancestors who stole land, who sacrificed their ways of being, doing, and knowing to enter into the social vocation of whiteness. Who were the harmers? They also need healing so that we can put down those dysfunctional legacies and make room for wholeness. What does ancestral healing look like in action? I get a question like that maybe once a week from somebody who wants to know, what can I do? What do I do? What ceremony do I do? What special spiritual spin do I put on this? And I'll tell you right now what it is, is you bring it present in your actions. It could, be, it could look like carefully tracing your lineage and working with spirit to understand them. You could feast them, you can sing to them, you can forgive them. Ancestral healing happens in ceremony for sure. And that's the fun esoteric part that I think everybody wants to participate in. This is the stuff that is deep and complex and mysterious. But it also happening, it happens in the unlearning and the relearning that we're all participating in right now. It isn't something you can pay for. It's an intimate expression of the soul. Ask your ancestor what needs healing and then listen. For example, my Haudenosaunee ancestors, most recently my mother, grandfather, and grandmother, lost their language, land, and culture. I heal them through actively learning my language and using it in my herbal practice, working to rematriate our homelands and the homelands of my indigenous relatives and participate in and share the culture with my family, who's even more cut off than I am. My black ancestors were stolen from land, were forced to build the foundation of a new culture that saw them as three-fifths of a human being, lost the land that fed their families, and were pitted against indigenous folks to benefit the settler colonialist project. To help them heal, I work to resituate black folks on farmland and strive to heal the rifts of lateral violence between black and indigenous communities through land-based wealth redistribution. Workshop on Friday. <laughs> um, I repair the harm that my white ancestors caused and created and perpetuated by speaking to it and illuminating it is the complex constellation of symptoms that form the current state of the land we all need to live on. It's not enough just to forgive them. If there was harm caused, we need to heal that harm in our current timeline in order for them to heal. It's only through active repair of harm that we can begin to collectively heal. It's only through this ancestor work that we can meet each other in the good mind. It's only through giving our grief to the land that we can heal. My friend and mentor, scholar and knowledge keeper Rick Hill, um, he's Mohawk, Six Nations, he taught me that good, mind is, good mindedness is a symbol for correct, balanced, and fair, and respectful thinking. Humans can share the thinking of the creator by using the good mind. Actually, and, and without going into the long story of where that even comes from, there are points where it's referenced that the good mind is also called the God mind. 
and what it is that it's spiritually minded. I met Rick in my early days at the University of Buffalo, where he was an adjunct professor. We worked together to rematriate wampum and language, and a few years ago we embarked upon a project at Six Nations that produced a Haudenosaunee conflict transformation curriculum for family engaged in the child welfare system. This cur um, the curriculum was developed to train conflict resolution facilitators to work from the Haudenosaunee customary practices that hold the safety and needs of the child at the center of the family. Through the achievement of a good mind, before working together to figure out the best plan of action when a child's well-being has been jeopardized, this technique is now being used on Six Nations and has been successful in keeping kids in our communities, with their families, with their languages. And even if the harms of the past cannot be healed between the parents or guardians, the possibility of establishing a middle ground where everyone is safe and working on their own healing can be achieved. The goal, of course, is to heal families and bring them back together, but that's not always possible. Sometimes folks go their own way, sometimes the hurt is too much to reconcile, but the goal is the mutual concern for the child is always centered. So how does all of this relate to biodynamics? On the shuttle ride, I chatted with some folks arriving from the airport trying to figure out why we're all here. This is a conference, a place where we've made pilgrimage to from all over the world, apparently. <laughs> Um, collective, we're here to gather collectively and celebrate the unique and healing science of biodynamics. I chatted with Gabby, a lovely architect who came all the way from Mexico to be here because she enjoys the connection she feels with when she comes together with this community. Folks who can talk about planting by the stars and the moon and about spiritual energy. We talked about music, intonation, atonement, and vibration. This is a community you can really get down with in a lot of ways. <laughs> when I come in here, I see these faces, and honestly, I'm like, I don't even need to put makeup on in this community. I just feel good. You know, the food is good. It's all good. Um, so I just, I feel really safe in a lot of ways, and I feel like I can share these things with you without feeling like you're going to shut down. Um, so. That was something that I think um, really, it was a fear for me coming in, is that this is the message that I bring, this is the work as I've explained that we do in the world, that I do in the world. And um, you know, oftentimes when, when folks get triggered in this way, they just get up and they walk out. And I don't want to see a bunch of people walk out. I want you to sit in the discomfort that are in the agreements and, and listen. And I appreciate that you've been doing that. Ibram X. Kendi said, we can't just talk about racism as, a, as an original sin. We have to talk about racism as the original cancer, as this original disease that has been killing America. This is the time of shadow work. The timeline has shifted from impending climate change being a future figment that, is, that our distant descendants might have to experience to a crisis that we are all currently witnessing and clamoring to find safety and possibly to at least staunch the bleeding of. There's an additional problem though. That land, dis that land dispossession that we were talking about, it sets some folks up to succeed, much like the soil and the beans that the Governor General is talking about. And many others get the short end of the stick. The soil isn't the same everywhere, but the beans aren't responsible for the soil. The bean it's not the beans' fault that they grew up in a specific kind of soil. This is the time when the imbalance in power can be most felt through the inescapable reality of land-based wealth redistribution. In order for us all to thrive, we must recognize the system is out of balance and be medicine for one another, biodynamic preparations for one another, to, be, to bioremediate our relationships and heal the toxicity of our collective soils. The Northeast is primarily unceded in this area. It's unceded territory, which means that it was literally never signed over by a treaty. It was literally just occupied with no consent. Our aim with Northeast Farmers of Color Land Trust is to repair that harm, not replicate it. 
by working alongside indigenous communities to listen and learn through open conversations with respect to their wishes for land and in their territories. More specifically, what we're doing is we're co-creating spaces to understand each other better. Our work is happening on the land, in ceremony, at kitchen tables, over the phone, over the internet, and in community. And what we're doing is we're creating an indigenous community consultation protocol so that if any piece of land comes available, the first thing that we do is go to the nations of those territories, whether they're here or they're relocated somewhere forcibly else, and asking them, what do you want to do with this land? What, this is your unceded territory. sure that I'm getting to everything. The United Nations set up a set of principles on reparations and immunity which provides basic guidelines around gross human rights violations. It holds that reparations should be proportional to the gravity of the violations and the harm that are suffered. Compensation for unpaid wages under slavery alone would add up to at least 5.9 trillion dollars. That doesn't include damages to black people because of such policies like Jim Crow, redlining, mass incarceration, or other injuries. So on top of the indigenous community, um, community consultation strategy, what we're doing is we've all, we're also um, setting up a reparations committee and administering a reparations map for folks to be able to go on um, so that we can have peer-to-peer -peer reparations happening between, instead of waiting for the powers that be to do something about this, you can do this at an individual level. So in closing, I just want to share this before um, Sapa talks. Um, I read this poem by Wendell Berry, and it speaks about the liberation of being present at one with nature, even if just for a moment. And he says, I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with the forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water, and I feel above me the day blind stars waiting for their light. For a time, I rest in the grace of the world and am free. What freedom looks like in this instance is the unburdening of our minds, the release of heavy weight, the heavy weight grief places on our spirits. I would challenge Barry on his albeit beautiful piece for one simple reason. He maintains the separation of humans from the wild. I invite you to consider yourself a part of that wild, a part of nature, not above it, but just an actual part of it. Our communities desire the same unburdening, the same freedom. There is ancestor work to do here, and we are standing at that mirror. It's time to look deep, see our ancestors behind us there, and help them by healing the injustice they either caused or experienced back there. Right now, the land is our most dear and threatened child. We need to find a way to unburden our minds so that we can meet one another in a healing space, to be medicine for one another, synergize with one another, and figure out how we can all offer to benefit the land in this urgent hour. Yeah. about time. Yeah, cool. Yeah, that's perfect. It is, it is. I'm going to keep things rather brief. There are a few things that I want to share with you. The first thing that I want to share is a poem by Miguel de Unamuno. It's called Throw Yourself Like Seed. Are you ready to translate? Are the translators ready? Okay. Shake off this sadness and recover your spirit. Sluggish, you will never see the wheel of fate that brushes your heel as it turns going by. The person who wants to live is the person in whom life is abundant. Now you are only giving food to that final pain, which is slowly winding you in the nets of death. But to live is to work. And the only thing which lasts is the work. Start there. Turn to the work. Throw yourself like seed as you walk and into your own field. 
Don't turn your face, for that would be to turn it to death. And do not let the past weigh down your motion. Leave what's alive in the furrow, what's dead in yourself. For life does not, does not move in the same way as a group of clouds. From your work, you will be able one day to gather yourself. It's a great poem. Then, within the few minutes that we have, the thing that I want to leave you with is what that work is. In 1914, June 28th of 1914, when World War I began, we were at the precipice of a new cycle, a new space. It's, it was a pretty chaotic space, as you know. We were in a time where our sense of identity and our sense of family was at threat was in danger, was threatened. Rudolf Steiner, shortly after, actually was on to things and was trying very hard, working with a number of folks, a number of traditions, to cultivate a path forward. I listened to a few lectures, some that happened, uh, what is it, June 7th, 1924, one in particular, and I, you know, I looked up the astrology and wanted to see what was going on. <laughs> Some really interesting things are going on. So, the moment at which World War I began, we were in the midst of figuring out the danger to our families. We were doing so through communication. Communication broke down. That was the first issue. Our disciplines of communication broke down. Rudolf Steiner comes up and says, hey, you know, Things have been pretty rough. I know a few folks who are talking about deep existential problems, and I think that they're doing so because they don't fully understand about, they don't fully understand the connection to land and the needs of the people who are connected to the land. They also don't understand, and this is where he offered his wisdom, they also don't understand what it is that they're connecting to. 1924, Saturn, great planet that it is, was in the sign of Libra. This is known to astrologers and those who follow a particular tradition that is related to star lore as a time for refinement of practice. Rudolf Steiner was refining practice. I think he did a pretty good job. I think he did an awesome job. However, his refinement wasn't about the proper application. Fast forward to January 12th, 2020. It's right around the corner. We enter a new cycle, the cycle that began with World War I, a cycle in which we were struggling and, and, and dealing with a shadow within our family. It ends. I don't know what it'll look like for you. I don't pretend to know those things. I don't know what it'll look like for you. But it ends. And when it ends, that's where the work begins. It is an application of all that you have known and all that you have hidden from yourself. And it will last for about 60 years. So remember to be good and kind to those who are coming up behind you. They have a lot of work to do. A lot of work, sorry. Um, this moment right now that we're in, the room that we're in, I want to share with you what I've been feeling and what it is.